Hi class. Uh, sorry this video is so late in finding its way to you, but um, it's been an incredibly <laughs> chaotic last week with um, just the number of internet issues that we've all been experiencing. Um, so I wasn't able to upload our video um, on O'Connor and um, upload or create on O'Connor McCullers and uh, Chuck Polinuk. Um, but I did want to address just some of the questions that have been coming up from some of you, right? Um, so we have to go back and we have to think about the grotesque. And we're looking at transitional texts, right? We talked about that during our last lecture, where these works are um, beginning to uh, bring us from modernism into postmodernism, uh, focusing a lot on tropes of existentialism. But with modernism, how do we redeem that sense of hollow brokenness? Well, we redeem that sense of brokenness and emptiness through art, right? Through the creation of art. Um, postmodernism, we don't, we don't really get there. <laughs> um, Instead, we're leaving it. And we'll talk more about postmodernism, not this lecture, but next lecture. Um, where um, we're not necessarily trying to uh, qualm or hide that anxiety or that emptiness, the shadow. Instead, we're just acknowledging it and leaving it as it is because we don't think that there's any way to overcome it. Um, there's a sort of staunch individualism um, or egoism associated with postmodernism, which we'll talk about, right? Um, and so when we look at McCullers, when we look at Flannery O'Connor, and then when we get to Chuck Palahniuk, we're seeing Palahniuk is very much a postmodern writer. Um, McCullers and O'Connor are beginning to bridge that gap between the two different philosophies, where McCullers is still high modernism, right? She's a little bit more difficult to, de to read and to decipher. Uh, her connection to Faulkner is very clear, um, stylist, style-wise, as well as um, um, her connection and sort of fleshing out of the old South versus the new South. Um, and so in order to really understand the tropes that these three authors are working in, we have to understand a little bit more about Bakhtin's theory on grotesque realism um, or carnivalesque, right? Um so we talked last class about Sherwood Anderson's The Book of the Grotesque, right? Which is the introduction to our section hands um, from Winesburg, Ohio, which is canonized in our book. Um, and so in The Book of the Grotesque, he actually defines, he was like a pregnant woman, only that the thing inside of him was not a baby, but a youth. No, it wasn't a youth. It was a woman, young and wearing a coat of male like a knight. It is absurd, you see, to try and tell what was inside the old writer as he lay on his bed and listened to the fluttering of his heart. The thing to get at is what the writer or the young thing within the writer was thinking about. Um, and um, Bakhtin actually defines, or he, 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 he uses the metaphor of an old woman who is pregnant and about to give birth to new life as the metaphor for the grotesque and for the, the, the introduction of carnivalesque. Um, and so 
we're seeing these same like parallels here in the book of the grotesque. And then later on, we begin to see that, that in the beginning there was truth. There was a great many truths. And what did the people do? Well, the people took them onto themselves and defined themselves solely by the singular truth, the singular identity, the singular belief. And it was that taking on of this new identity, defining one's whole self by this identity. And then the destruction that that can entail, right? Um, so if we look at just a little bit from the the Winesburg, Ohio section in our book, I'm looking at the hand section on um, page 253. Upon the half decayed veranda of a small frame house that stood near the edge of the ravine near the town of Winesburg, Ohio, a fat old man walked nervously up and down across a long field that had been seeded for clover, but had pr had produced only a dense crop of a yellow mustard weeds. He could see the public highway along which went a wagon filled with berry pickers returning from the fields. Um, and when we look, we're actually seeing that George Willard, wing in the presence of George Willard, who for 20 years had been the town mystery, lost something of his timidity and his shadowy personality submerged in a sea of doubts, came forth to look at the world. With the young reporter at his side, he ventured in the light of day into Main Street and strode up and down the rickety front porch in his own house, talking excitedly. The voice that had been low and trembling began the shrill, became shrill and loud and bent forward. Um, the story of Wing Biddlebaum is a story of hands, their restless activity, like unto the beating of the wings of an imprisoned bird, had given had given him his name. Some obscure poet of the town had thought of it. The hands alarmed their owner. He wanted to keep them hidden away and looked with amazement at the quiet, inexpressive hands of other men who worked beside him in the fields or passed driving sleepy teams on country roads. The story of Wing Biddlebaum's hands is worth a book itself, book in itself. Sympathetically set forth, it would tap many strange, beautiful qualities in obscure men. It is the job of the poet. In Winesburg, the hands had attracted attention merely because of their activity. With them, Wing Biddlebaum had picked as high as 140 quarts of strawberries in a day. They became his distinguishing feature, the source of his fame. Also, they made more grotesque, also they made more grotesque and already grotesque and elusive indi individuality. Winesburg was proud of the hands of Wing Biddlebaum in the same spirit in which it was proud of the Banker White's new stone house and Wesley Moore's station, Tony Tip, that had won the 215 trot in the fall of the races of Cleveland. As for George Willard, he had many times wanted to ask about the hands. At times, an almost overwhelming curiosity had taken hold of him. He felt that there must be a reason for their strange activity and their inclination to keep hidden away from only growing respect of Wing Biddlebaum kept him from blurting out the questions that were often in his mind. Once he had been on the point of asking, the two were walking on the field in the field in the fields on a summer afternoon and stopped to sit on a grassy bank. All afternoon, Wing Biddlebaum had talked as one inspired. You are destroying yourself, he cried. You have the inclination to be alone and to dream, and you are afraid of your dreams. You want to be like others in, the, in town here. You hear them talk, and you try to intimidate them. On the grassy bank, Wing Biddlebaum had tried to again to drive his point home. His voice became a, became soft and reminiscent, and with a sigh of contentment, he launched into a long, rambling talk, speaking as one lost in a dream. 
out of the dream of Wing Biddlebaum made a picture of George Willard. In the picture, men lived again in a kind of pastoral golden age. Across open country came clean limb young men, some afoot, some mounted upon horses. In crowds, the men came to gather, but the feet of an old man who sat beneath a tree in a tiny garden and who talked of them. So there's this like weird sort of centering that continues to happen around around the hands of Wing Biddlebaum um, and George Willard's sort of obsession with them. We we're here seeing like the the prosperity that the hands bring, right? That the that that the strength that the hands bring, that the um, the picking that the hands can bring, and it's the sense of fame because they also represent. Um, something very symbolic that's important to the community that they live in. But then we see here, he was one of those rare little understood men who rule by a power so gentle that it passes as a lovable weakness and their feeling for the boys under their charge. Such men are not unlike the finer sort of women in their love of men. <sighs> And yet it is but cru crudely stated. It needs the poet there with the boys of his school. Adolf Myers had walked in the evening or had sat talking until dusk upon the schoolhouse steps, lost in a kind of dream. Here there went his hands, caressing the shoulders of the boys, playing about the 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 tousled heads. As he talked, his voice became soft and musical. There was a caress in that also. In a way, the voice and the hands, the stroking of the shoulders and the touching of the hair was a part of the schoolmaster's efforts to carry a dream into young minds. By the by the caress that it was in his fingers, he expressed himself. He was one of those men in whom the force that creates life diffused, not centralized. Under the caress of his hands, doubt and disbelief went out of the minds of the boys, and they began also to dream. And then the tragedy, a half-witted boy of the school became enamored of the young master. In his bed at night, he imagined unspeakable things, and in the morning went forth to tell his dreams as facts. Strange, hideous accusations fell from his loose lips. Through the Pennsylvania town went a shiver. Hidden, shadowy doubts that had been in man's, men's minds concerning Adolf Myers were galvanized into belief. The tragedy did not linger. Trembling lads were jerked out of their beds and questioned, he put his hand, his arms about me, said one. His fingers were always playing in my hair, said another. Adolph Myers was driven from Pennsylvania town in the night with the lanterns of his hands, with a lantern in lanterns in their hands, and a dozen men came to the door of the house where he lived alone and commanded the dress commanded that he dress and come forth. For 20 years, Adolf Myers had been, had lived alone in Winesburg. He was put forth. He was but 40, but looked 65. The name of Biddlebong he got from a box of got goods seen at a freight station as he hurried through the eastern Ohio town. Although he did not understand what had happened, he felt that the hands must be to blame. Again and again, the fathers of the boys had talked of the hands. Keep your hands to yourself. I'm on, four, on 256. In the darkness, he could not see the hands, and they became quiet, although he still hungered for the presence of the boy who was the medium through which he expressed his love of man. The hunger became again a part of the loneliness of his waiting. The nervous, expressive fingers flashing in and out of light might well have been mistaken for fingers of the devotee going swiftly through decade after decade of his rosary. So we see, right, that there's like the might and the power and the beauty that is, is 
pent up in the hand, right? And that the hand represents something that is that is um, sort of inescapable. And it's his obsession with the hand, right? And how he then that that sort of defining of a, the the singularity of a man to one specific area eventually leads to that area becoming his downfall. And so we see that even now he can't gross, escape his grotesque. He's changed and redefined his identity. And yet that, 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 that coming back, that obsession that George Willard has, it's that same sort of um, obsession that we see um, affecting him in his earlier uh, life. Um, so then when we get to McCullers, right, in order to understand the grotesque or in the carnivalesque, we have to ident be able to identify certain characteristics in the work, right? Uh, the first one is a reversal of hierarchies, an inversion of the social art hierarchy, light and dark. Um, that imperfection is beautiful. Madness is genius, right? Um we have eccentric behavior, indulging yourself in social unacceptable behaviors. And then lastly, non-linear pattern of narration. And this becomes very popular in postmodern literature, right? Where we're not following a sequence of events as they're happening in real time, that the plot is not unfolding in front of us in a, a linear narrative pattern, uh, popular in modernism and then becomes very popular in postmodernism. Um, we're not going to spend as much time on the McCullers piece, right? But already we can sort of see the reversal of hierarchy where Miss Amelia falls in love with the hunchback, right? Um, physical deformity is also something that's very common in grotesque literature. Uh, and we'll see that, well, you see that a lot in Flannery O'Connor's work. We don't see that so much in this one. We'll look a little bit at areas where maybe the body is reflecting uh, as a reflector and is reflecting the qualities of the grotesque. But in um, Good Country People, the central character's name is Holga, and she only has one leg, right? And because uh, her, and so she uses that sort of physical deformity to say or to reveal something about Holga, right? Because Holga, rejects very much so any sort of uh, religion or faith or really spirituality. And she's obsessed with logic and knowledge and the belief that you can know your, you can know things ultimately through uh, logical streams of thought, right? That the universe is knowable and that emotions have no real place in for Holga, right? That emotional intelligence is, isn't, isn't real for Holga. Um, and we know, we see that that, that sort of crippling assumption is mirrored in the body, right? Because she only has one leg. And so because she only has the one leg, that means that she doesn't have the foundation to stand on. She's crippled by her desire to know for, for knowledge or for logic and her complete denial of, of spirituality or, or faith. And so it leaves her physically deformed, right? Or more that her, her physical deformity is symbolic of her, um, of her mental deformity in a sense, right? Um, when we look at the McCullers piece, obviously we can make very strong connections to what I just mentioned, but I wanted to bring us to this passage, um, and it reads, first of all, love is a joint experience between two persons, but the fact that this is a joint experience does not mean that it is a similar experience to the two people involved. There are the lover and the beloved, but these two come from different countries, 
Often the beloved is only a stimulus for all the stored up love, which had lain quiet within the lover for a long time hitherto. And somehow every lover knows this. He feels in his soul that his love is a solitary thing. He comes to know a new strange loneliness, and it is this knowledge which makes him suffer. So there is only one thing for the lover to do. He must house his love inside himself as best he can. He must create for himself a whole new inward world. A world intense and strange, complete in himself. Let it be added here that this lover about whom we speak need not necessarily be a young man saving for a wedding ring. This lover can be man, woman, child, or indeed any human creature on this earth. Now the beloved can also be of any description. The most outlandish people can be the stimulus for love, right? We're going back already to that sort of eccentric behavior as intrigue or as positive, right? Social nonconformity in the grotesque, in the carnivalesque is what creates intrigue for us, right? We're, we're interested. We can't look away from the wreck, right? Um, uh, a man may be a doddering great grandfather and still only and still love only a, a strange girl he saw in the streets of Chiha one afternoon, two decades past. The preacher may love a fallen woman. The beloved may be treacherous, greasy headed, and given to evil habits. Yes, and the lover may see this as clearly as anyone else, but that does not affect the evolution of his love one whit. A most mediocre person can be the object of love, which is wild, extravagant, and beautiful as the poison lilies of the swamp. A good man may be a stimulus for a love both violent and debased, or a jabbering man, mad, mad man may bring about in the soul of someone a tender and simple idol. Therefore, the value and quality of any love is determined solely by the lover himself. <sighs> We're seeing that for McCullers, the act of being in love is very isolating and um, anxiety inducing. My camera fell. Get back up there, girl. There we go. <laughs> Maya. My setup is very, it's funny to see. Um, and so it, for them, the, 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 well, let's keep reading. It is for this reason that most of us would rather love than be loved. Almost everyone wants to be the lover. And the curt truth is that in a deep secret way, the state of being loved is intolerable to many. The beloved fears and hates the lover, and with the best reasons, for the lover is forever trying to strip bare his beloved. The lover craves any possible relation with the beloved, even if this experience can cause him only pain. I'm going to read now a passage from Bakhtin, right? Truth is not born, nor is it to be found inside the heart of an individual person. It is born between two people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogue and interactions. For McCullers... Love can never be a unifying act. That instead, we have the lover and the beloved. And so the lover is always projecting onto them or loving them in the way that fulfills the lover. Right? And so because we're, we're not able to love the individual 
in the way that they would experience love. It forever is us, the lover, robbing the individual, stripping the individual bare, searching the individual for that truth of companionship. And it's maybe impossible. And we find that the act of being loved by someone is also painful. Right? It is for this reason that most of us would rather love than be loved. It's a, in a way, in a sense, it's that push even past this, this argument that Bhaktin is making, right? That what is love? Love is nothing. But love is born between two people who are collectively searching for that truth, right? It's the, that, that unity of searching is what brings the two together. For McCullers, it can never be a unity. It's always a singular act that's projected onto another person. And that projection is what strips them of their individuality, of their of their their personhood. Okay, hopefully that's going to stay. Um, now let's look at the ending of A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um, first off, O'Connor is notorious for her play with cliches, right? As a way of revealing to us something about the character. Um, and usually it's to reveal to us the fact that the character is empty, do I have the wrong book? Yep. Of course. Hold on. There we go. You gonna make it? Okay. Here, we'll throw a naked lunch on there just to be safe. Okay, so now let's look at Flannery O'Connor, right? Um, and O'Connor is very famous for her usage of cliches as a way of revealing something um, inherently broken with the character. Coffee, right? Um, we also know that she's she's very famous for playing with this with the cliche, right? And so anytime that you see a character who routinely uses the uses a cliche, it's a it's a symbol, it's a signal to you, reader, that like this this character is empty, right? Um, that this character has no substance, and so we need to be careful of this particular character, right? Um, and that's the grandmother. The grandmother is very problematic. Um, she, we could ultimately say she succumbs to two very fatal sins. The first sin is pride. Um, if you look that the grandmother never actually names the mother, that she is just the children's mother. Um, and so the grandmother doesn't really look at her as being significant at all because she didn't come from the grandmother, right? Instead, she is just the bearer of the grandmother's lineage, right? That she creates more of, she creates more life of the, of the grandmother. She carries on the, the grandmother's line, but she is not the grandmother's child. She's not in any way related to the grandmother. Um, Bailey is a very interesting sort of weak character. Um, June Star um, and the brother are just awful children. Um, the, the mother is almost an absent presence throughout 
the narrative where we hardly ever see anything from the from the mother. <sighs> and then we get there's also too the grandmother is this very sort of I mean she's a very gross character um in that There's the scene where she sees the little boy on the road with no shoes and no clothes on. And instead of looking and seeing like that is despair and destitute poverty, she looks at it and she thinks that it's beautiful. She's also always wanting to go back to, to visit a time before, right? That's how we even get onto the road where we meet the misfit. Um... And so it's because of her arrogance, her pride, and her desire to return to morals of the past that bring us to the point that we see uh, the family sort of succumbing to. Um, in a way, it's the grandmother's fault that they all die, right? Symbolically, they also are all from the fruit of the poison tree. When we look at O'Connor, O'Connor is very religious, right? She's Catholic, um, and she's sort of famous for having said, and I wish normally I teach from her collection of prayer, her prayer journal that she kept. Um, which we see that O'Connor is living in a time, in a generation, right? Think about how in modernism we see Wallace Stevens writing the Sunday morning poem. And so how does, how does that character, uh, worship? She doesn't go to church, right? Um, and so we're no longer like putting our values or basing our values on um, religion. But then O'Connor is very much a religious writer, right? She's a, she's a Catholic. Um, and so she's famous for having said, I write the way that I write because I am Catholic. And that's very important because she doesn't write this despite the fact that I'm Catholic. It's because I am Catholic. So what we're what we learn from this passage is that she, in a sense, is attempting to flush out a sense of morality in a time when we're beginning to abandon morality. <sighs> and then we get to a good man is hard to find. Is there any good men in the story? There's a lot of ways that we can read The Misfit. The Misfit is a very interesting and very, and I was, I'm happy that I'm actually able to give this lesson after having read some of your daily questions and reactions to it. Um, because he's very troubling, right? The grandmother is not good. The grandmother is, she is a dark, matriarchal shadow on the family. Uh, we see, too, the misfits foreshadowed at the very beginning of the narrative. The grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. She wanted to visit some of her connections to East Tennessee, and she was seizing at every chance to change Bailey's mind. Bailey was the son she lived with, her only boy. He was sitting at the edge of his chair at the table, bent over the orange sports sections of the journal. Now look here, Bailey, she said. See here, read this. She stood with one hand on her thin hip and the other rattling the newspaper at the bald head. Here, this fellow that calls himself the misfit is loose from a federal pen um, and headed toward Florida. And you read here what it says. He did did to these people just you read it i wouldn't take my children in any direction with the criminal look that uh, like 
that aloose in it. I couldn't answer to my conscience if I did. Um, so already we're getting a sense of how manipulative, how um, uh, sort of self-absorbed, self-obsessed that the grandmother is um, at the very beginning. And we're also introduced to the misfit at the very beginning of the narrative, right? Um, and so we, we're, we're, we're already sort of aware that there is a sort of sense of danger on this journey that they're going to undergo. Now, again, the grandmother asked Bailey to turn down the side street because she thought that she was going to be able to find the old South Southern mansion that she remembers as a child, right? Because she's always wanting to hearken back to those times, right? She wants to, to revisit the past, but the past is really, especially in the South, is very problematic, right? How far back do you want to go? Well, obviously she has very little regard for people of color. Um, and so, ugh. we're going to now, we're going to look now at the end of the narrative. Listen, baby, Bailey began, we're in a terrible predicament. Nobody realizes what this is. And his voice cracked and his eyes were as blue and intense as the parrots in his shirt. And he remained perfectly still. The grandmother reached up to adjust that brim as if she were going to the woods with him. But it came off of her, came off in her hand. She stood staring at, at staring. And after a second, she let it fall on the ground. Hiram pulled Bailey up by his arm. If he were assisting an old man, John Wesley caught hold of his father's hand and Bobby Lee followed. They went toward the wood and just as they reached the dark edge, Bailey turned, supporting himself against a gray naked pine trunk. He shouted, I'll be back in a minute, mama. Wait on me. Come back this instant, his mother shrilled, but they all disappeared into the woods. Bailey boy, the grandmother called in a tragic voice, but she found she was looking at the misfit squatting on the ground in front of her. I just know you're a good man. She said desperately, you're not a bit common. No, I ain't a good man, the misfit said after a second, as if he had considered her statement carefully. But I ain't the worst in the world, neither. My daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sister. You know, daddy said, it's some that can live their whole life out one uh, without asking about it and others has to know why it is and this boy is one of the latters he's going to be into everything he put his black hat put down put on his black hat and looked up suddenly and then away deep into the woods as if he were embraced again embarrassed again sorry i'm sorry i don't have on a shirt before you ladies he said hunching his shoulders slightly he buried his uh, we buried our clothes and we had uh that we had on when we escaped and we're just making do until we can get better we borrowed these from some folks we met he explained that's perfectly all right the grandmother said maybe bailey has an extra shirt in his suitcase i'll look and see where are where are they taking him the children's mother screamed again. The children's mother screamed. Right? We're always, we're never, we never see the children. We never see the identity of the children's mother. Daddy was card himself. The misfit said, "You couldn't put anything over on him. He never got in trouble with the authorities, though. Just had the knack of handling them. He could be honest too if you'd only try." You could be honest, too, if you'd only try, said the grandmother. Think how wonderful it would be to settle down and live a comfortable life and not have to think about somebody chasing you all the time. The misfit kept scratching in the ground with the butt of his gun as if he were thinking about it. Yes, somebody's always after you, he murmured. The grandmother noticed how thin his shoulder blades were behind his hat because he was standing up looking down on him. Do you ever pray, she asked. He shook his head. All he, she saw was the back black 
that black hat wiggle between his shoulder blades. No, he said, there was a pistol and a, a pistol shot from the woods followed closely by another. Then silence. The old lady's head jerked around. She could hear the wind move through the treetops like a long, satisfied unsuck of insuck of breath. Bailey boy, she called. I was a gospel singer for a while, the misfit said. I've been most everything. Been in armed service, both land and sea, at home and abroad. Been twice. Twice, twi twice married, been an undertaker, been out at the railroads, plowed Mother Earth, been in a tornado, seen a man burnt alive on set on once, and looked up at the children, um, and looked up at the children's mother and the little girl who were sitting close together, their faces white and their eyes glassy. I even seen a woman flogged. He said, "Pray." pray the grandmother began pray pray i never was a bad boy that i remember of misfit said in an almost dreamy voice but somewheres along the line i'd done something wrong and got sent to the penitentiary i was buried alive and he looked up and held her attention to him by a steady stare that's when you should have stay, started to pray, she said. What do you do to get sent? What you do to get sent to the penitentiary that first time? Turn to the right. It was a wall. The misfit said, looking up again at the cloudless sky. Turn to the left. It was a wall. Looked up at the ceiling. Looked down. It was the floor. I forgot what I'd done, lady. I sat there and sat there, trying to remember what it was I'd done, and I ain't recalled it to this day. Once in a while, I would think it was coming to me, but it never come. Maybe they put you, they, they put you in the mistake. They had the papers on me. No, maybe they put you in by mistake, sorry, the old lady can't, the old lady said vaguely. No, he said. It wasn't no mistake. They had the papers on me. You must have stolen something, she said. The misfit sneered slightly. Nobody had nothing I wanted, he said. It was a, a head doctor at the penitentiary said that said what I had done was kill my daddy, but I known that for a lie. My daddy died in 19, out 19, of the epidemic flu, the swine flu. I mean, not the swine flu, sorry. Um, the, oh no, what is the, what is the flu? What's the World War One flu? Spanish flu? Uh, yeah, so he's referencing the Spanish flu, right, from World War I. Um, and I never had a thing to do with it. He was buried in Mount Hopewell Baptist Church yard, and you can go there and see for yourself. If you would pray, the old lady said, Jesus would help you. That's right, the misfit said. Well, then why don't you pray, she asked, trembling with delight suddenly. I don't want no help, he said. I'm doing all right by myself. Bobby Lee and Hiram came back from the woods. Bobby Lee was dragging a yellow shirt with bright blue parrots in it. Throw me that shirt, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. The shirt came flying at him and landed on his shoulders. The grandmother couldn't name that name what the shirt reminded her of. No, lady, the misfit said while he was buttoning it up. I found out the crime don't matter. You can do one thing or you can do another. Kill a man or take a tire off his car. Because sooner or later, you're, gonna, <laughs> you're going to forget what it was you done and just be punished for it. The children's mother had begun to make heaving noises as if she couldn't get her breath. Lady, he asked, would you and the little girl like to step off yonder with Bobby Lee and Hiram and join your husband? So there's a lot of interesting symbol symbolism parallels happening here. First off, the misfit is a gracious man. He was also in prison or he was convicted of a crime that he was innocent of convicting, right? 
we can read the misfit as a sociopath, as a psychopath, as a madman, or we can read him as a Christ figure. And he's a postmodern Christ figure. His father died, right? Um, and if we look at the sense of the grotesque, there's a there's a really interesting passage made, right? Uh, that Jesus, in a sense, is the grotesque. It's a paradoxical anomaly, right? God flesh. And the word became grotesque as a as a quote of John, right? Um It's also the low becoming high. When did the father die? The father died with World War I. That's the shattering of purpose, the breaking of the veil, right? Um, that's when the anxiety first becomes real. And so then the son has to deal with a time without foundation. And he's, he's kind. Right? He looks at the, the mother who's heaving and making noises, right? In immense pain and he takes pity on her lady he asked would you and the little girl like to step off yonder with bobby lee and hiram and join your husband they're dead like we know that right there's two shots bobby lee um and her son are dead yes thank you the mother said faintly, her left arm dangled helplessly as she was holding the baby who had gone to sleep in the other. Hep that lady up, Hiram, the misfit said as she struggled to climb out of the ditch. And Bobby Lee, you hold on to that little girl's hand. I don't want to hold hands with him, June Star said. Oh, she's such a brat. Well, and she's smart, you know, like I wouldn't want to hold it. Right. Uh, he reminds me of a pig. The fat boy blushed and laughed and caught her by the arm and pulled her off into the woods after Hiram and her mother. Alone with the misfit, the grandmother found that she had lost her voice. There was not a cloud in the sky, nor any sun. We're in this weird between again. We're always in this weird between. There was nothing around here, her but woods. She wanted to tell him that he must pray. She opened and closed her mouth several times before that, before anything came out. Finally, she found herself saying, Jesus, Jesus, meaning Jesus help you. But the way she was saying it, it sounded as if she might be cursing. So before we have this very like sort of blind faith, moral, staunch uh, pride that the grandmother embodies, right? Uh, she's wanting to hearken back to a time of, of faith, a time of, of clear morality. But the problem is, is that time's never existed because that time was also the time of, um, this is obviously a very problematic American time. Like point in American history, right? We can't return to the old South because the old South was never real. It was always it was always a place of gross mistreatment and injustice. And the using of religion to justify that treatment. And so the grandmother believes that she is right. She believes she's morally superior, but she's a good man is hard to find. Sounded as if she might be cursing. Yes, some the misfit said as he agreed, Jesus thrown everything off balance. It was the same cuz 
with him as with me. He hadn't committed any crime. And they could prove I had committed one because they had the papers on me, of course. He said, they never show me my papers. That's why I sign myself now. I said, long ago, get you a signature and sign everything you do and keep a copy of it. Then you'll know what you done and you can and you can hold up the crime to the punishment and see they match. And in the end, You'll have something to prove. You ain't been treated right. I call myself the misfit, he said, because I can't make what all I done wrong fit what all I gone through in punishment. There was a piercing scream from the woods followed by close followed closely by a pistol report. Does it seem right to you, lady, that one is punished a heap of a heap and another ain't punished at all jesus the lord the lady cried you've got good blood i know you wouldn't shoot a lady i know you come from nice people pray jesus you ought not to shoot a lady i'll give you i'll give you the money i've got that's a reference to the catholic church right that we used to have penance so we could buy our way into salvation Lady, the misfit said, looking beyond her, her far into woods, there never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. There were two more pistol reports, and the grandmother raised her head like a parched old turkey hen crying for water and called, Bailey boy, Bailey boy, as if her heart would break. Jesus was the one, only one that raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then... It's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left best you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said, and his voice became almost a snarl. Either he did it and you need to believe in it with your whole being because that is the ultimate reversal of uh, our sense of right and wrong, right? If we look at the binary, it, we have right, wrong, alive, dead. These are things we know to be true. But we had the reversal of the grotesque, right? Uh, the The reversal of hierarchies. And it's our lack of faith. Maybe he didn't raise the dead, the old lady mumbled, not knowing what she was saying, feeling so dizzy that she sank down in the ditch with her legs twisted under her. So let's read this passage one more time. Jesus was the only one who ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he wouldn't have, he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can. So he's saying Either you believe or you don't believe. And what is the grandmother's answer? Maybe he didn't raise the dead. That's a moment of doubt, right? The old lady mumbled, not knowing what she was saying and feeling so dizzy that she sank down in the ditch. She fell with her legs twisted under her. I wasn't there, so I can't say he didn't, the misfit said. I wished I'd have been there, he said, hitting the ground with his fist. It ain't right. I wasn't there because if I had been there, I would have known. Listen, lady, he said in a high voice. 
if I had have been there, I would have known and I wouldn't be like I am now. His voice seemed about to crack and the grandmother's head cleared for an instant. She saw the man's face twisted close to her own as if he were going to cry and she murmured, Why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She reached out to touch him on the shoulder. So before, if you weren't connected to the grandmother, you, you served no purpose, right? That sense of pride and moral rightness and justice, ju like, and, and moral right, righteousness. Um, and now she's looking at the misfit and she has this moment of, of empathy. It's also this moment where she's real because she's never been real up until this point. She's only been this like talk box for, for what her, the past generation values, but she's never actually filtered it through herself. Misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his gun down on the ground and took off his glasses and began to clean them. So he's a madman. Or he just redeemed her from the ultimate sin, unforgivable sin, right? To doubt. She doubts. Maybe he didn't raise the dead. And then she comes back while well, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She shoots him three times and he shoots her three times. Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. Hiram and Bobby Lee returned from the woods and stood over the ditch looking down at the grandmother who half sat and half lay in a puddle of blood with her legs crossed under her like a child's and her face smiling up at the cloudless sky. How are we supposed to approach God? How are we supposed to approach heaven? Like a child, innocent and wonderment. Innocence and wonderment. And she's cleansed by the blood. Without his glasses, the misfit's eyes were red-rimmed and pale and defenseless looking. Take her off and throw her where you thrown the others, he said, picking up the cat that was rubbing itself against his leg. She was a talker, wasn't she, Bobby Lee said, sliding down the ditch with a yodel. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been somebody there to shoot her every day of her life. Some fun, Bobby Lee said. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said no real pre pleasure in life. Whew! Oh, that's probably one of my favorite canonized Flannery O'Connor stories. Um, good country people's fun, right? Then I would also let that be one that you use for your papers. Um, the essential principle of grotesque realism is degradation. That is the lowering of all that is high and spiritual and ideal and abstract. It's a transfer to the material level of the sphere of the earth and body. 
Um, so now we got to look a little bit at guts. And to be quite honest, uh, I have not been excited about recording a lecture on this short story. Um, Polinuk is one of the most celebrated uh, postmodern writers of his generation, right? Uh, he's the author of Fight Club um, and Choke. <sighs> this, this short story comes from his book, his short stories, uh, a collection of his short stories titled Haunted, um, and it's gruesome. It is not an easy read to get through. Uh, and I was glad to see that some of you really got the point of it. Uh, some of you didn't. And you're like, Miss Lear, I'm going to, I have no idea why you made me read this. This is horrifying. Right. And I use my Southern accent there because Lord, who sheesh. Uh, if we were, if we were in a classroom outside of the South, we also probably wouldn't be as shocked by reading this narrative as we are, because there is very much still that sort of sexual taboo um, that our, our culture is afraid of. Right. Um, and we see, you know, like that, that desire to embrace one's sexuality um, and enjoyment of sex is, I mean, we've been, we've been seeking to redeem, in a sense, se sexual gratification since before Chopin, right, in America, um, where, you know, it's not the can of shrimp that satisfies Calixa. Uh, so with the grotesque, we also see that they have a tendency to want to redeem all which is morally taboo um, and also redeem the parts of the body which are lower. Um, so that's a reproductive, sexualized, digestive, and excretory functions of the body. And yeah, we see all of that in guts. Um, the, the daily reality that's a, I was listening actually to a sermon done on this and it was really fascinating. Um, and he says it's the daily realities of the human flesh. Cause like people are beautiful. And this week we're going to read Ginsburg, right? And Ginsburg exalts us. Holy, 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 holy. He redeems us. But as beautiful and, uh, you know, what let's go back to Walt Whitman, I sing the body electric. That would be a great, um, a great work to use if you wanted to look at um, if you wanted to use guts for our upcoming essay, right? I sing the body electric where Walt Whitman talks about uh, the, the physical male release. That's a very, ta that's like a very um, censored way of talking about pearl diving. Um, but he, it's, it's beauty. It's beautiful for Whitman because it, it creates life and, um, all parts of Whitman, he, all parts of the human body are, are, are miracles to Whitman, right? Should be praised according to Whitman. And then we get to this one and it's like, whoa, what are you doing, Chuck Palahniuk? This is horrifying, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, to this day, I think about this every time I eat calamari, can't help it. Um, and so as a way of shocking us out of our complacency and, uh, and our desire to ignore these taboo subjects, Paul Anuk writes this essay and it's completely unapologetically. Uh, Lily, you nailed it, right? Uh, so anybody who wants to go back and look at Lily's post on this, on this essay, you should. Uh, and, um, John, you were getting there.
you're close, right? Uh, that upon rereading it, it's also humorous. And that's a huge part of the, of the, of the, of uh, carnival-esque, right? Uh, is humor. Uh, one Probably one of the most famous carnivals that we can point to in the United States is Mardi Gras, right? Fat Tuesday, where we go out and we get all our sinning in. And then we have uh, Lent and we redeem for all sin and we done that year, right? Um, and I don't, it's, uh, I'm becoming, as uh, I don't know where this is coming from, right? Um, but par a practice that was performed on Fat Tuesday was to give dark sermons, right? <laughs> um but so when we look now, we see just how far we can stretch this motif, right? We begin with McCullers, who's still really like embodying that sense of high modernism, um, difficulty in narrative structure to trace like linearly what's happening, right? Uh, we have the hunchback, the physical deformity. Then we get to good country people and it's a spiritual deformity, right? The grandmother, the grandmother is spiritually deformed. Um, and incapable. And then we get to Polonuk and we just, we push it as far as we can, right? I'm not going to read anything, um, really from the piece because I don't, I don't want that recorded. <laughs> but if we look, there is one, there's one very, very, I mean, obviously the carrot is emblematic, right? Of, it's symbolic of shame, right? And shame is the truth that these characters use to define themselves, right? Is we have the ghost carrot is what he writes. Even now that he's grown up, the invisible carrot hangs over every Christmas dinner, every birthday party, every Easter egg hunt with his kids, his parents, grands, kids. And the ghost, that ghost carrot is hovering over all of them. That is something too awful to name. Because we can't speak of it. Why can't we speak of it? Because it's a social taboo. Uh, sexual experimentation, sexual gratification, uh, is so talked is isn't talk is talked about so little that we have these stories of kids like experimenting on themselves, uh, and then like also getting into some very sort of like dangerous behavior because. They, there's like a sense that your um, your sexual desires are already sort of condemnable and inappropriate. Um, so then there's like this like secret seeking out of um, there's it, it is it's all done sort of in the dark and without real direction. Like we have the brother who is like, you know, sending uh, bizarre stories home to the younger brother and um, that he's like this sort of, you know, he's very much not um, thinking about the, the younger brother's goodwill or, or well-being at all. And so it's just like, how far can we push this kid? Um, but there is one, uh, there's one passage that I want us to look at quickly. It's on the first page still. Looking back, or we'll start from the beginning. The trouble is even the French don't have a phrase for the stupid things you actually do say under pressure. Those stupid, stupid, desperate things you actually think or do. That's the spirit of the stairway. Oops, sorry. Uh, some deeds are too low to even get a name. Too low even to get talked about. Looking back, kid psych experts, school counselors now say that 
most of the last peak in teen suicide was trying to choke while beating off autoerotic asphyxiation. Their folks would find them a towel twisted around their kid's neck, the towel tied to the rod in their bedroom closet, the kid dead, dead sperm everywhere. Of course, the folks cleaned up. They put some pants on their kid. They made it look better. Intentional, at least. The regular kind of sad teen suicide. Um, and for me, that's really where we get to the whole heart of this essay is in that passage, right? Um, because there's something to be said that we can take solace in not having the embarrassment of the reality of the situation found out. That That is, um, to go back to the, the grotesque, which we've been arguing, right? That is a paradoxical anomaly, again. Just as God flesh is a paradoxical anomaly, so is the regular kind of sad teen suicide. The regular kind of sad suicide. That there is no regular kind, right? First off, you, if you're in a moment of such extreme despair that you decide to take your own life, there's nothing regular about that, right? There is a sort of a communal divorcing of one's self, um, a, a succumbing to the darkness of one's um, mind, a desperation of a complete despair so much so that you don't want to continue. So in that vein... If we look at how the children do pass, is it better to lose your life in pursuit of intense pleasure in a moment of ecstasy and release? Or is it better to die in darkness, in despair? And so that's what this is. Like these are all, these are all like these boys who are playing around with uh, um, different methods of sexual gratification that can harm them, and they can't talk about it with anyone. It just is that lingering invisible carrot. Um, the first one we see that is just sort of uh, um, uh, a. <laughs> sort of like you know the shame is what that what the one character suffers from because he can never ask like hey mom what'd you do did you ever find that carrot or like hey mom and the mother never brings it up right and so it's just always there lingering in the distance that that emblem of shame and then we see again like the 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 them slowly become more and more deformed by it Right, they become more and more grotesque, where it begins to take on physical characteristics. Um, so it's interesting, right? That this piece is all. Whenever I teach this piece, is always very controversial for students because it's like, oh, Miss Lear, why did you make us read it? Um, why not? Um, and two, now it's interesting because there's always like an intense reaction to Guts, but it's also one of the only things everyone reads because uh, it plays again, too, to that sort of like voyeurism that we all have. We want to watch the wreck. We want to see it play out. Um, but uh, John is very right. Like, it's funny, too. Right? It is a funny short story. <laughs> so, yeah. 
uh, I'll, I'll post our lecture. Hopefully I'll be able to get PowerPoint to work again um, and be able to post our lecture by Thursday at the latest for this week on Ginsburg, uh, Kerouac, Burroughs. Uh, and yeah, brace yourself for naked lunch. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an emotionally exhausting, difficult read in many of the same veins of guts, uh, but without the narrative, well, there's narrative, but without the, um, clear narrative, um, arc. So, um, yeah, um, Onward we go, further and further, marching towards the end, uh, which is the end of our class, not the end of, like, you know, everything. Good luck. <laughs>